Okay, well, bear with me a little bit. It's the first time I've actually done this, but uh, the as of February, uh, as of uh, February, uh, as of May 13th, uh, which would be Friday the 13th, I believe. This is the uh, selected uh, assets and liabilities of commercial banks in the United States. So basically, what you have here is uh, it's like year to year sort of thing of um, how much the uh like everything as far as amounts accounts whatever the fuck let's see uh bank credit is uh was at 8.9 percent uh which in march was 10.2 percent so it's gone down uh securities and bank credit which is minus 2.1 percent which in march it was 1.1 percent so that's also down this is what a this is what a, a um surplus does it takes excess money that was in the account out. It doesn't allow banks to be able to loan out or, you know, people to be able to spend and all that other stuff. So just you have to remember that surpluses are always bad for the non-government. Uh, deficits are always good for the non-government because that gives money that gives money to the people that can spend it. Um, so there you go. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, Treasury and Agency Securities. Uh... That's actually, in comparison, has gone up, uh, at least as far as numbers go. Uh, in February, it was 9.9. In March, it was three, minus 3.8. And uh, it went up to uh, 4.2. So, yeah, that just tells you that, uh, that you know, the securities is not uh, um, uh, cashing out treasuries very much. So, it's not putting money back into, it's not putting money into the economy that much it was um other securities uh see march it was 21.4 percent uh, and april has gone down to 6.5 percent um loans and uh, loans and leases and bank credit uh that's gone down also from 15.5 15.1 uh, to 14.8 commercial and industrial loans uh has gone down to 21.6 Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 20, first of all, in March it was 21.2, and in April it was 16.4. Real estate loans, you know, buying a house, I think, uh, stuff like that. Uh, it's actually that shot up to 13.6. So that's that's a good sign as far as that part goes. Um, but that also, to be fair, that could also be other real estate uh, companies taking out those loans. So that could be a possibility too. Um, but anyway, so it was 8.5 in, in, in March, but in April has gone up to 13.6. Um, residential real estate loans uh, also gone up to 12.5 from 7.0. Uh, revolving home equity loans, which I think that tells me that it is like the reverse mortgage sort of thing, um, which is uh, up to 3.4. In, uh, in March, it was minus 2.4. So I guess that means that there's more liquidity in homes nowadays, so people can actually uh, can actually uh, uh, take some out of it. Also, could, that could also be the same same homeowners that uh, was building stuff during the pandemic, you know, like a new deck or some you know something to build up liquidity within their own homes, and you know, you know, put some uh, add some uh, add it uh, add some value to them. Anyway. So let's see, closed and residential loans was up 13.5%. Uh, that's up uh, from 8.2 in March. Uh, commercial real estate loans uh, up 14.7 uh, from uh, 9.8 uh, in March. Consumer loans, uh, less people are taking out loans to 21.9 compared to 23.7. Credit cards and other revolving uh, revolving plans uh, that's gone up slightly, 35.7 uh, from 34.4. See that's also because of the fact that a lot of people are not getting that much money in regards to like you know not having to uh, go into the credit cards. Uh, see other consumer loans, 8.7 so that's down, 13.7 um, uh, in March. Right now it's 8.7. Other loans and leases, uh, 9.0, which is down from 16.4 in March. Uh, less allowance for loans and leases, lo uh, losses, uh, is minus 26.7. Um, that's, that's, 
I guess, up technically from 2.2. That it was in March. Uh, cash assets, uh, it's minus 74.3. So that that tells me that they're actually uh, that they're selling selling more assets off. Um, let's see, uh, loans to commercial banks. 127.3 uh, in April to, um, compares to 98.4 in March. So that just tells me that they're loan, you know, kind of like a, uh, interbank loans. There we go. Uh, other assets, including trade and trading uh, assets, uh, that's gone up 33.1 from 26.1. Uh, she deposits 0.2%. Uh, uh, that I'm not sure that's down or up from 1.6. Uh, I'm guessing that's down actually. I'm that, that kind of math I'm not, I'm not familiarized with. Um, anyway, let's see. Large time deposits 36.0. Uh, that's up from 3.2 minus, oh, that's minus 3.2. Other deposits, um, uh, in March it was 2.0, now it's minus 2.9. Borrowings, uh, let's see. 3.0 to now minus 32.2, which means I'm guessing that that means they're kind of under the underwater 32.2. I'm not sure about that though. Uh, other liabilities, including trade liabilities, uh, is up 54.1% compared to 32.2%. Uh, total liabilities uh, minus 3.3 uh, 3 in April, which is guessing good, and 7 uh, 7.0 in regards to. Uh, to March, so yeah, that tells me they're uh, selling more assets and um, they're loaning more as far as the bar goes. Let's see, was there anything else? Nope, that's it as far as the bar goes. I, I use the that, that's part, that as far as the part goes a lot, as you can see. Okay, I have some interesting news. Apparently, Google's Russian division is filing for bankruptcy. This comes uh, today, as far as the bar goes. Uh, Georgia, uh, God Lord, Google's Russian division submitted a notice of intent to declare bankruptcy after officials seized its uh, bank account that has made it unattainable for our Russia office to function, including employing and paying Russian-based employees, paying supplies and vendors, and meeting other uh, financial obligations, Google's spokesperson told Reuters. Like many other companies, Google suspended most of its commercial activity in Russia following the country's invasion of Ukraine in February. Despite that and the bankruptcy filing, it will continue to provide Russians with access to free services such as Search, YouTube, uh, Gmail, Maps, and uh, Android for the time being. In May last year, Russia fined Google around $82,000 for failing uh, to delete thousands of pieces of content it deemed to be illegal. Authorities then fined the company approximately $98 million in December for, uh, for similar reasons. That was estimated to be around 5.7% of Google's 2021 turnover in Russia. In recent months, tele telecoms regulator uh, Rash Kamaz, okay, anyway, uh, Rash, Rash, uh, Rash, Rash Kamanaz, I'll just say that, uh, has been pressuring YouTube to lift restrictions on access to Russian media. A Russian TV channel reported last month that bailiffs seized around 1 billion rubles, approximately 15 million, from Google after it declined to restore the station's access to its YouTube account. While Russia has blocked many other platforms and services, including Google News, it doesn't currently plan to prevent users in the country from accessing YouTube. It said, to, it said this week that residents would likely, offer, likely suffer as a result of such a move. Uh, Reuters reported that streaming platform, platform has, uh, has around 90 million Russian users. Russia's Minister for Digital D Development also said that despite testing its own uh, closed-off version of the internet, the country plans to stay connected to the global network. You know, what's funny about that is the U.S. has done the same thing here. Uh, they have banned, like, Russia TV from YouTube. Uh, they have banned, like, as far as, like, you know, sharing most of what Russia would be news on Twitter has been has been uh, censored or been, uh, been taken off, so... I mean, 
wouldn't you think it would be the same thing for Russia and Russia as far as them doing the same thing? The biggest problem I see with uh, the United States and Russia, pretty much any country is, since they all had their point of views, uh, not a lot, and especially the United States. The uh, United States has, has its own point of view, but it's also king of the propaganda. And it learned that from Nazis in the, in the, in the 40s. Uh, it was the 40s, I think. Um, Nazis is exactly the same thing as what the United States is doing now in regards to information. Um, and it doesn't help the fact that the president of Ukraine is kind of playing footsies with the freaking Nazis uh, as far as the battalion goes. Uh, so, to, uh, as far as people who think that, uh, that the United States is right in regards to, you know, d uh, helping defend Ukraine from Russia, I'm not sure that Ukraine or Russia or whomever started this whole thing, I'm not sure that Russia is the sole problem in this. Uh, Ukraine um, failed to implement some policies that were involved in number two version of the Minsk Agreement. Um, and the one thing Russia said uh, when uh, when they were uh, negotiating the end of the Cold War was that NATO shouldn't be expanding itself into that region. That was apparently that was a part of the original agreement. And obviously NATO has not been, you know, following those rules because they've been doing exactly that. In fact, uh, Finland and Sweden are have confirmed that they're going to go for NATO membership, meaning they'll, that NATO will be quite literally on the doorstep of Russia. And Russia can then look at that as a means of aggression, you know, meaning the start of another Cold War, because that's what the United States wants to freaking do. That's what Joe Biden and the uh, military industrial complex want to do. They want to go and pillage and take shit from countries we even know that they can always just sit there and freaking you know pay for licensing of using you or just buying them buying the person persons out of whatever product they may have you know pull the trader joe's trader joe's tend to sit there and buy whomever um brings a product uh, a product that they want to sell in their stores on the market and buys the rights to them and that's what i've seen anyways as far as every product in trade joe's everything is pretty much trade joe's branded kroger's does that qfc which is owns which owns kroger's uh safeway does the same damn thing you name it they do it as far as that part goes so it is not like that's a lost art that means that you just want to spend more money on military bullshit and go into other countries and strip take their shit. That's not right either. So that's all kinds of fucked up too. It's like, why would you want... What? You're destroying property. You're destroying people's lives. And for what? Pretty much nothing good, really. I mean, they're trying to privatize the fucking world now. Yippee. For money that... We are a sovereign currency, so we can sit there and print as much money as we fucking want and buy it. Buy this shit. We can. But the U.S. government wants to... They want to pretty much, let's just say, um, hand uh, hand their... Uh, their um, hand their, uh, their, their um, oh, uh, financial contributors... A job I'll just say that um, yeah that's 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 not the right way of doing it that's why I do not vote Republican or Democrat uh, that's why if I see either one of them say some kind of bullshit on Twitter I do my best to call them out and I do my best to look up what they're talking about and show them the opposite of what they're actually talking about is right anyway uh, let's see and I don't normally um, read financial news from mainstream media but this is kind of interesting uh this is a european economy portion of cnbc by an elliot smith um says well first of all obviously it has key points so key points first further rises uh further ri rises in the in the coming months are expected to be might be modest 
and the market backs the Central Bank of Russia to continue to unwind its emergency interest rate hikes or hike. While the headline inflation rate notches its highest since 2002, month on month consumer pr uh, price growth slowed sharply from 7.6% in March to 1.6 in April. As of Tuesday morning in Europe, the ruble was trading as, uh, at just above 62 to, to the dollar, having plunged it to an all-time low of 150 to the dollar. So I'm guessing it's one, uh, one point, I'm not even sure what that means. It's low, uh, 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 time low of 150, anyway, uh, on March 7th. Russia believes it is it has swerved a financial crisis as its currency uh, rallies and economic data improves. But strategists say the number masks some ugly truths in Moscow from from Moscow. Although inflation in the country is running hot, there are signs that prices rises are slowing slowing and will continue to do so while the ruble. Russian ruble has gone from all-time low in March to the world's best performing, best performing currency this year. Meanwhile, uh, econ uh, economic activity indicators are improving, and Russia has thus far managed to avoid defaulting on its foreign currency debt, despite Western sanctions freezing large swaths of its reserves. Russian inflation came in at a two-decade high of 17.8% year-on-year in April from 167 in March, but prices rises are, sorry, price rises are beginning to show signs of slowing. Consumer price growth slowly or slowed sharply from 7.6 in March to 1.6 in April, and non-food good prices increased by 0.5% versus 11.3% in March. Further rises in the coming months are expected to be modest, and the market uh, market backs backs the central bank of Russia to continue to unwind its emergency interest rate hike, possibly with a 200 uh, basis point cut in June. It comes after CBR implemented a emergency rate hike that took the country's uh, key interest rate from 9.5 percent to 20 percent. In late February, serving days, at, several days, excuse me, at, days after uh, Russia's unprovoked invasion, that oh, wasn't unprovoked, my butt, of Ukraine, and in a uh, bid to rescue the ruble, the central bank has since been able to move the rate to 14%, as the outlook for inflation and the currency improved, and capital economics, uh, capital economics, sees further changes ahead. In quote, today's inflation fighters, or fighters, excuse me, figures will further support the central bank's assessment that the acute phase of Russia's crisis has passed. Emerging markets economist Leon Peach wrote in a Latin uh, note last week. In quotes, it's possible that consumer prices rise by uh, rise by less than one percent month to month in May as a Whole and that headline inflation ends up peaking at just below 20% later this year. Ruble resilience. The slowing price increases follow a steep appreciation of the ruble, which in turn reduces import prices. As of Tuesday morning in Europe, the ruble was trading at just over 62 to the dollar, having plunged to an all-time low of 150 to the dollar. I'm guessing it's one, I, I'm not really sure what the heck that means. As far as 150, that could be, it could be a dollar fifty. As far as I, or anyway, whatever. I mean, maybe it's one point. Uh, whatever. Anyway, 150 cents or something. I have no fucking idea. Anyway, to the dollar on March 7th, following the announcement of a suit of uh, international sanctions in response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Despite the dollar's broad strength, owing uh, in part to its perceived safe haven status amid risk aversions in the global market, the greenback has done almost 70% against the Russian currency this year, uh, year to date. Strict capital control measures from Russia's central, central bank, which include uh, ordering companies to convert 80% of their foreign currency rev uh, revenues into rubles, have helped revive the alien currency. The Kremlin also initiated banned Russian citizens from the transfer and transferring money abroad, and transfers are now limited to $10,000 per month for individuals until the end of 2022. 
the Russian economy continues to recover from the initial shock in late February and early March. Goldman's economist Clemens Graf uh, wrote in a note earlier this month, concerns about financial stability are fading. Rube, uh, the rube has strengthened back to early 2020 levels. For many analysts, analysts however, Moscow's actions to defend its currency are tantamous to manipulation and that demand has been created that would not otherwise exist and capital controls have effectively turned the ruble into a managed currency. Charles Henry Manchu, uh, bless you, uh, no, anyway, uh, Chief Investment Officer at Swiss, uh, Switzerland based uh, Size ba uh, Bank suggested that while the Russian ruble central bank has deployed a range of tools to make the ruble look viable, very few people outside Russia want to buy a single ruble unless they absolutely have to, and traders no longer see the ruble as a free trade currency. If Russia succeeds in finding a solution to the Ukraine problem with the, uh, the corollary of withdrawing sanctions and restoring trade relations with the West, the ruble can potentially retain its current value, he said. On the other hand, if the, measure are, the measures are withdrawn without resolution, the ruble could collapse, resulting in an expa explosion of domestic infl deep inflation and a deep e economic recession in Russia. And Russia has also undertaken another measure to shore up its currency. The CBR resumed gold purchases on the domestic mar uh, metal mar metals market after a two-year absence. Uh, in the hope of storing uh, value to protect Russia wealth against inflation in the event of further shock to uh, foreign exchange liquidity. Another strong move went relatively unnoticed in the Western media. The Bank of Russia assumed gold pur uh, purchases at a fixed price of 5,000 rubles per gram between March 28th and June 30th. Well, it was supposed to, uh, I'm guessing it was supposed to hedge against the loss against the USD as far as the far goes. <clears throat> they basically just proved that MMP was right by saying that if you don't, uh, if you don't have debt outside of your currency, you'll be fine. And they hold a good portion of the market in wheat and other things and gas as far as the park goes as well obviously india has picked up uh, their demand for russian oil china's done the same thing uh greece has done the same thing apparently greece is actually the most as far as the park goes from what i've seen um so russia's actually doing a lot better than what most people literally everybody thought that they would i thought that be, i knew they'd be fine i i saw how they managed their 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 monetary uh, policies i saw that they d the only debt they had were in u.s dollars and they had plenty of reserves on hand for that but the u.s forced them not to um pay for their outside uh u.s bond debt um so i mean but they were able to do it because they were still able to process those payments through other means in regards to banks so I knew from the very beginning that they'd be fine because they are sovereign currency. They are a sovereign nation. They have very little in outside debt. Uh, they are full of natural resources that they can always trade with. Uh, same thing with the Ukraine. That's why I was always hoping that Ukraine wouldn't take a dime from the IMF because the IMF is the pretty much the global predatory loan uh, in, um, uh, company. That serve that does debt payments uh, in like three different uh, currencies. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why the U.S. is is was the world currency, as far as the work goes, because a lot of people, a lot of uh, not people, I'm sorry, a lot of countries, still have their money pegged to the U.S. dollar. So I mean, right now, uh, hopefully Argentina will get off of that. Um, Mexico, I'm not sure if they are, but if they are, I hope they also do the same thing. Um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, da -da -da, another strong move went, uh, went relatively okay. I was read that already. Uh, as gold is traded in US dollars, Manchu, um, just mention some of that, noted that this enables the CBR to link the ruble to gold and set the floor price for ruble in dollar terms. 
for the ruble rises could therefore increase the price of gold and Russia has been accumulating the precious metal rapidly since its annexation, uh, annexation of Crimea in 2014, now boasting the fifth largest stockpile in the, pri uh, in the world. Therefore, the move offers further protection for the Russian economy against liquidity constraints resulting from further sanctions and deterioration of the country's foreign currency reserves to service dollar-denominated debt. So basically, the U.S. played itself. And Biden is no better than Trump in regards to policies. Well, actually, if you think about it, Trump was actually better as far as Russia because that was one place, even though people kept saying that he has some kind of debt to Putin or whatever. I mean, he kept them at bay. He kept the whole thing at bay. Biden comes in and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. So both parties suck butt. That's pretty much what I'm saying as far as the part goes. Anywho, uh, see so the closely watched purchasing managers index eco economic indicators are also showing some improvement after plunging from 48.6% in February 40 to 44.1% in March. <coughs> Uh, with a reading below 50 indicating contraction, April's figures rose to 48.2%. This was mostly on the back of improved output and shorter supplies at delivery times, or delivery times according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, Russian's uh, financial constitution, or con I'm sorry, conditions, not constitution, but uh, conditions, have improved mostly on the back of a narrow CD CDS or credit default swap spreads as Russia paid principal interest uh, in euro bonds and USD. Goldman's graph noted Russia successfully made payments to holders of $2 denominated Russian sovereign bonds maturing in 2022 and 2042 and, and worth the collective of $650 million before the end of 30-day grace period and on March 4th However, analysis still warn uh, there is a high probability of Russia default within the next two years. <clears throat> Not two months, two years. That's the equivalent of the uh, that the reverse curve thing that people keep bitching about as far as U.S. economy. Like, we could be in a recession. When? Within the next two or three years? Okay, that's about the same thing as saying we're going to have a massive earthquake in about 5-10 years. Same principle, I think. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, temporary victory. The collective improvement in the data has led Russia President Vladimir Putin to claim that the West's economic uh, blitzkrieg or uh, lightning, uh, lightning war had failed. In the way it is, yeah. Uh, yet, while Russia appears to have fended off Im impending economic uh, collapse, the long-term outlook is less optimistic as the knock-on effects from mitigation, uh, mitigation measures and the threat of further sanctions remain in play. Uh, a survey by the Central Bank of Russia, and I'm sorry this is long, but uh, the, of, of Russia, of more than 13,000 businesses recently revealed that, they, that many were already running into trouble importing goods in the, in the country. Okay, depending on where they're getting their stock, as far as the progress, and of course, uh, these uh, these including car parts, packaging, and microchips, and raw material uh, shortages are forcing some uh, companies to suspend factory operations or seek resources elsewhere. The survey found. Meanwhile, Elena Rebikava, deputy chief economist at the Institute of International Finance, told BBC last week that the superficial economic indicators would mean little to those on the ground when job security remains hazy for many Russians. Within this year, we will see the effect on Russian economy as companies start to run out of parts or equipment and have to start laying people off or putting them on unpaid leave, she told Grid News in a separate uh, interview this week. Okay, so that was it. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> wow, I have another raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, I think that's what happened. 
I think I have another raid, though. <laughs> um. <laughs> Andy Attack 2018, thank you for the raid. And this and Slayer Music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um Hey and welcome back. Um let's see this is one little uh, one little uh um article I wanted to read from realprogressives.org. Um if you're interested, go to groupprogressives.org slash donate uh, or slash join. Um, they are an excellent organization and I'm proud to be working with them. Anyway, so this article is, this was not a surprise. Uh, I'm guessing this goes along with uh, the Roe v. Wade thing. Um, this is by an Alexandra Zayas. Um, this was not a surprise. This is from May 12th, so a couple days ago. Um, how the pro-choice movement lost the Battle of Roe, by again by Alexandra uh, Zayas, originally published in Pro Publica, as all eyes were on the U.S. Supreme Court on Tuesday after a leaked draft majority opinion indicated it is planning to overturn Roe v. Wade. Pro Publica spoke with journalist Joshua Prager, who spent 11 years uh, dissecting the landmark case that guaranteed abortion rights for women across the country for his acclaimed book the family row an american story in quotes prager interviewed upwards of 500 people including key figures on both sides of the case mostly uh, most notable is plaintiff uh, norma McCor mccorvey i think who was better known as jane Woe. Uh, jane Roe. uh jane Roe. okay yeah um and delving into the untold story behind her life, those are the children who uh, she gave birth to and uh, uh, mon monumental, mon oh, monumental, me, monumental case, uh, Prager unfurled the decades-long history of the American war over abortion. Prager uh, said indicators of the justices' learning, uh, learnings uh, were clear while observing arguments in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, a case challenging a 2018 Mississippi law prohibiting uh, most abortions after 15 weeks uh, gestational age, which is the subject of the Supreme Court's draft opinion. Though the court confirmed the uh, authenticity of the document published this week by Politico, the final vote and decision are still pending. Prager discussed why he believed the road to this week's revelation was paved. Was paved, in part by decades of mistakes, mistakes and missed opportunities made by the pro-choice movement. In his book, Prager refers to those who support the right to abortion the way they refer to themselves as pro-choice, and those opposing abortion the way they refer to themselves as pro-life. We inherit. Uh, we adhere to the, to these conventions during our interview. The interview has been edited for pre for brevity and clarity. This is the interview. Uh, did you expect this day when would come? I absolutely did. Anyone who was a close follower of the issue could see that this was happening when we listened to the oral arguments and Dobbs. Uh, we knew where all of the justices stood, pretty much. But there was there were two who were thought might go either way: Justice Amy Coney, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Justice Brett Kavanaugh, two of two of Trump's three appointees. And to listen to them speak and question during oral arguments in Dobbs, uh, we could see where they were going. Kavanaugh over and uh, over again would uh, was speaking about the pre presidents that the Supreme Court has previously overturned. Justice Barrett, meantime, was speaking about the fact that adoption is, as she put it, a viable alternative to abortion. What was so fascinating about this and tragic, if you're a person who believes that Roe uh, ought to be overturned, was was not uh, ought not to be overturned. Excuse me. Was that the Supreme Court did not need Justice John Roberts, the Chief Justice anymore. The conservative bloc now doesn't need him. 
they have the votes they need uh, five to four without him. He is uh, an incre incrementalist. He is a person who respects precedent. He really cares about the image of the court. Does not want to see. Does not want it to be seen as simply a political body. And he was desperate to not actually have the headline that he that we had last night. He wanted to see Roe maintained. The sort of gutted, but he lost. So this was not a surprise. If you if you step back further, when Roe was ruled upon in 1973, it galvanized those opposed to it, and it gave the pro-life movement a very simple, clear target: a new uh, raison uh, raison d'être. Okay. We want to overturn Roe. This is the culmination of a 49 and a half year efforts and different approaches and novel approaches. And unfortunate again, unfortunately, again, if you if you are a person who believes in the reproductive choice, the pro-choice did not take a lot of that seriously for many years. And they are so much to, uh, they are as much to sort of blame for this day as the pro-life will take credit for. Tell me a little more about the blame the pro-choice movement shares. The pro-choice movement did not foresee a war here. Uh, Narol's uh, executive director in 73, when Roe was ruled upon, told her board after the ruling, the court has spoken and the case is closed. They saw this as it basically is over, we won. The very, very opposite is true of the pro-life, uh, who said, Okay, now we have this thing. Now we have to think about this strategically. How will we go about returning uh, Roe? As a result of this imbalance, the pro-choice were playing catch up really, uh, up really for 49 and a half years. As the pro-life movement has over and over again come up with many different ways to chip away at Roe, and it has been remarkably successful. Just to give you a few examples. In 76, the Hyde Amendment, which said that you can no longer pay for abortion with Medicaid. In 89, the case of Webster that was, ruled, that was a ruling against the use of public resources for abortion. 2007, Gonzalez v. Carhartt banned a specific type of abortion procedure. And then, of course, just this year in Texas with SB8, it was a very novel approach coming with a way to, give, to have an I uh, end run around the to, no wait, I'm sorry approach uh, coming up with a way to have an end run around the enforcement of abortion by deputizing private citizens to sue anyone who was helping someone have an abortion in that in any way. The pro life also used technology in a way that had never been used before by showing fetal uh, photograph uh, photography. They used a language that had never been used before, for example, coining the phrase partial birth abortion. They also used pseudoscience in a remarkable way. They came up with, the, with this very novel approach called post-abortion syndrome, saying that if a woman had an abortion, an enormous percentage of the time uh, wait, an enormous percentage of the time she would suffer psychological, psychologically as a result of that. That's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. The majority of women who have abortions uh, express relief as opposed to regret. If there is something that causes women to grieve, the studies shows, show it is relinquishing their child to adoption. These were all pro-life weapons in attacking Roe, and over and over again you had the pro-choice movement outfoxed. In the early 2008, one of the uh, attacks on Roe was led by lawyer Alan Parker, who had represented Norma for a time. The suit said that Roe needed to become null and void because conditions had changed in the years since it had been filed. And the only way to file this suit was to have the original plaintiff file it. So he came representing Norma, and he filed the suit. What ended up happening was that the pro-choice basically ignored the suit. They said that it was a sad publicity stunt, and they did not file a single brief defending Roe in this, what, in this case. 
and it ended up re uh, introducing into the judicial system uh, the, uh, these affidavits filed by women who said that, that abortion harmed them and that idea ended up uh, going up uh, right up to the Supreme Court to Justice Anthony, uh, Anthony Kennedy ended up citing them in 2007 in Gonzalez v. Car Carhartt and it was evidence that Parker's lawsuit had been incredibly effective and powerful. It shows all the different ways in which the pro-choice had failed to meet the pro-life had have failed to repeat their arguments uh, and their and strategies. And it speaks to a simple uh, human reality that it's much easier to try to knock something down than to defend it. What we're going to see now is the very same problem that pro-choice had, the pro-choice now are arguing to have, because now uh, you are going to see that this is going to galvanize the tens of millions of people who are horrified about what's happening now. They know uh, we have a, as simple a marching orders as the pro-life used to have. Okay, uh, used to have to reinstate Roe or to uh, come up with a, another come up with another way to c ensure that abortions will be legal for women across the country. For more of this, you can go to realprogressives.org, and it is, last I checked, the the top of the page. And again, this is uh, this was not a surprise by Alexandra Zayas from March. Uh, for, sorry, from May twelfth of this year. And it's in the health and well-being. I'd like to thank you for watching. Uh, I apologize for making that short, but uh, yeah. Um, thanks for watching. Support this channel. Support with progressives.org. Um, yes. Uh, thanks for watching and peace out for now. I will be tomorrow. I will be at a protest uh, downtown Columbus, um, and it's uh, a. Oh, what is it? I will put. I you know anyway. It's a, it's, I've been, I try to, I've been trying to, um, cover every protest that happens in Columbus, uh, just because they, I think they deserve to have a live audio, uh, live, live, uh, stream on them. And yeah, not to say that anybody else hasn't done it, because a lot of people have done it as far as protests and especially the violence, uh, especially the violence that happened during the BLM protests from last year, uh, or, yeah, from last year. Um, but yes, I wanted to. I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, uh, the protest is about an African man, a African uh, American, who um, was killed by by officers. Of course, um, I think it was. Um, anyway, yeah. I'll uh, hold on. We just got to get more information about that. Okay, I apologize for that. Yeah, it's uh, accountability for Casey. Call to action uh, for tomorrow. On May 19th, uh, now they put in uh, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. PDT, which is actually, I think, 12, 12 noon my time. Uh, but yeah, about 25 people are going. I suppose it's going to be about an hour. And it's going to be on 345 South How uh, South High Street. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on as far as I park it. That's where I'll be at tomorrow, live streaming. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be having it on YouTube or Facebook. Um, but it seems like I'm going to be doing more on Facebook. Uh, probably my profile so just calvin taylor on uh facebook uh, if you see well yeah my ugly mug's not on there anyway either way it'll be on there either way i'll be down there tomorrow doing that but that's what's going on it's again it's uh, accountability for casey accountability for casey as i said um uh okay here we go what to expect for for nearly 18 months now the family of casey goodson jr has had to fight for accountability for his murder while his fight has lo long focused on Franklin County Sheriff's Deputy Jason Meade uh, or at Conv uh, Convict Meade. The fight also requires accountability from the government agency that enables a Sheriff's Deputy with a violent history to take Casey's life. Let's see, there's more to this. Uh, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office hired, trained, and enabled a violent uh, deputy who eventually took the life of Casey Goodson Jr. Following Casey's murder, they never fired Jason Meade or took any official action against him. They instead allowed him to retire and keep his pension funded by taxpayer dollars. 
Eventually, Meade was indicted for a murder, but only after the prosecution, the prosecutor's office delayed that indictment uh, to wait uh, by waiting six months to appoint special prosecution. Gary Tyak's office ran on a platform of police reform and thus far that promise has not only been gone unfulfilled, but they have decided to stand with Jason Meade to the detriment of his family and his community. Casey's family has filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against Franklin County, instead of resolving this matter of allowing the lawsuit to proceed while the family pursues their own accountability. Franklin County has successfully asked the court to delay the civil lawsuit until the, conclu the conclusion of Meade's criminal trial. This could last until 2023 at the earliest, as well as we've seen from CPD official, uh, officer uh, Andrew Mitchell and others, this criminal pr process could actually take years. Franklin, could, uh, Franklin County has, let, has to let the people know where the, they stand. You cannot claim to be for the people without, while fighting, uh, fighting the people. Casey was murdered on December 4th, 2020, and Franklin County has taken no steps to allow his family and his community to heal from this tragedy. They are prepared to sit and wait and see what happens with Meade after some in indefinite period of time, as if that changes the fact that a citizen of this country was murdered in the cold blood by an employee of, the country, of this country. Uh, our Franklin County Prosecutor's Office is not only active defending the murderer, but an office that is... Uh, da da da. Crutching, obtain, shoot, defending murder, but uh, an office that is supposed to protect the citizens of this country, uh, of this county, excuse me, and obtain justice for us continue, uh, continues to delay and deny justice through every step of the process. That is not the will of the people, and justice will be denied, uh, won't, will not be denied. Stand with us and continue to fight for, ju for justice for Casey Goodson, Goodson Jr. and his family, and in showing that the power is with the people uh, see it Thursday May 19th so that's what that's what I'm going to be and that I'll be uh, I will be live streaming that on Facebook I believe anyways thanks for watching uh, support this channel support with progressives org and I'll see you tomorrow be yourself for now North Korea has that 32 out of 33 modern industrialized countries have that You're gonna pay for it. We're gonna be like North Korea. We'll have to borrow the money from China. Where are you gonna find the money?